Hello and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I am a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I am a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are covering a folk tale from Jharkhand that one of you requested. This one is a Santali story, featuring a lot of characters who make one bad decision after another. Two princesses venture into a dark forest, and have a lot of weird things happen to them. That's the thing about going into dark forests without adequate protection. Something terrible is bound to happen. And that something in today's story includes a group of monkeys who would love to have a human girl for dinner. So let's jump right into the story. It begins in medieval India with two princesses. They had the same king and queen as parents, so no evil stepsister thing going on between them. The elder sister, whom I shall call Mithkudi, took care of a younger sister, who was called Barkudi. The sisters were in the palace grounds, just playing games, as was to be expected of princesses who never had to depend on studying or working to ensure a comfortable life ahead as they were playing some sort of a ball game barkudi noticed something in the sky was it a plane was it superman no it was a bird mithkudi thought it was a crow and barkudi thought it was a raven but because crows have 16 primary feathers called pinions and because raven have 17 of those i guess the distinction between crows and ravens was a matter of opinion here it was not at all unusual to see a bird flying in the sky i mean that's what birds do what was different was that this crow dropped something It was a piece of fruit, a persimmon, and it landed right near the sisters. Without a thought, the sisters picked up the fruit and bit into it. That's shocking and unsanitary. I mean, the piece of fruit was partially bitten into by the crow. It had also been carried in the crow's talons, which for sure had never been cleaned. Ugh. not to mention that the piece of fruit had landed down on the ground and picked up some of the dirt from the ground too miraculously the sisters ate the fruit and did not need to be rushed to the emergency room quite the contrary the fruit tasted marvelous they had never tried a persimmon before and They thought this was the tastiest thing since sliced bread which isn't saying much because sliced bread by itself isn't very tasty the princesses absolutely wanted to have some more so they decided to follow the source thankfully for them they hadn't lost sight of the crow that brought the fruit in the first place It was very easy not to lose track of the crow because it had immediately landed on the branch of a nearby tree and had been cawing away furiously as he saw the sisters steal and eat the meal that he had worked hard for Maybe this is why crows have such a tendency to keep stealing unattended human food left outside They are really trying to take revenge for this incident anyway 
The crow eventually stopped cawing as he saw that the princesses were not going to leave him even a single bite. And he would have no choice except to go back and get another fruit. So he turned around and took flight and headed in the direction of the persimmon tree. Quick, let's follow the crow. He'll lead us to the tree, suggested Mithkudi. Mm, we are princesses. We should have servants do this for us, her sister replied. But there was no one around, not a soul, and the crow might disappear from view any minute now, so they must hurry. And they did hurry. Surprisingly, these palace grounds did not have so much as a guard at the walls. So these two young princesses went straight from palace grounds to dark forest within minutes without meeting anyone. The kingdom had labor shortages or budget cuts or something. The princesses didn't know. And they hadn't cared enough to learn the whole story. Anyway, the crow seemed to be very accommodating of being followed by two very slow princesses. Despite his earlier animosity towards said princesses for having eaten his meal. The crow even flew under the tree line in the dark forest so that the princesses could continue to track its flight. And when it started getting darker, the crow cawed so they could tell where he was by the sound of his voice. Was the crow doing this so that the sisters could share in and probably finish up all the fruits of his favorite tree? Of course not. The crow had something far more sinister in mind, which we'll see soon. In trying to achieve its objective, the crow would even have sent them GPS directions and turn-by-turn -turn navigation instructions if it could have. But in the absence of that technology, he had to make do with patiently guiding them to what he was sure would be their doom. When the girls finally got to the tree, they were completely exhausted, but also delighted at seeing the tree full of fruit. They climbed and grabbed and ate as many of the fruits as they could. And then the princesses took stock of their situation and began to worry. They had no way of knowing where they were and where the path back home was. The crow had long gone. As soon as they had reached the tree, it had grabbed another piece of fruit and flown off. Barkudi got the distinct impression that it had an evil grin, as if it was assured that the princesses were about to meet their end or something. Anyway, they had a more immediate problem than finding their way home. Barkudi was thirsty, very thirsty. And also, she was too tired to move an inch. She couldn't walk even one extra step. Mithkudi decided she would go fetch some water for her sister. This was a good sign that Mithkudi was starting to act more responsible now. Running away from the palace without notifying anyone? had been a very irresponsible thing to do. She had put not only her own, but her sister's life in danger and jeopardized the kingdom's succession plan. But now, in a further show of her increasing sense of responsibility, she told Barkudi to hide in the hollow of a tree to avoid being caught by any predators that might be looking for a snack. Mithkudi rushed in a few different directions, 
until she heard the sound of running water. She rushed in the direction of the sound and found a little stream. Quickly, she had her fill. And then, she made a pretty little cup of leaves and collected some water in the cup and walked back in the direction of the tree where Barkudi was waiting. Unfortunately, there was a mischievous forest spirit that was floating around at that time. It decided to play a practical joke on Mithkudi by puncturing a big hole in the leaf cup. The spirit was also invisible, so Mithkudi was really puzzled how a hole had appeared out of nowhere and drained the water. But she decided she must try again. So she went back and made another leaf cup. But the spirit was watching and swooped out and did its thing again. This happened several more times. Mithkudi, at some point, should have questioned the value of the leaf cup she was making and perhaps considered that if she couldn't take water to Barkudi, she could have taken Barkudi to the water, even carried her if she was still tired. And all this while, a king, whom we shall call Raj, was observing Mithkudi's attempts. He had been hunting in this area. Now, looking at Mithkudi, he decided based on just her appearance, that she was a princess. He was indeed right about that. Raj also decided that he needed a wife so she could perform repeated tasks for him at his palace, including cooking and cleaning his room. Yeah, talk about the expectations in a patriarchal society. And Raj's kingdom was probably also suffering budget cuts or labor shortage similar to Mithkudi's, so that the queen herself was expected to chip in to help with cooking and cleaning. To Raj, Mithkudi had just demonstrated her ability to pig-headedly perform the same tasks mechanically without complaining or expressing frustration. He thought she was ideal for the role. The king jumped out from behind the bushes and frightened Mithkudi into dropping her water from her 21st leaf cup before the spirit even had a chance to sabotage this cup. The spirit thought that this new tactic of having Mithkudi drop the water out of fright was more interesting than punching a hole in the leaf cup, which was getting boring now. But the spirit would not get to try this new tactic. Not on Mithkudi at least. Because Raj also told Mithkudi that she was hired as his queen. Strange men jumping out from behind the bushes and suddenly offering to make you their wife? I don't know. But Mithkudi went by his richly dressed appearance and thought, why not? She was about to formally accept his proposal, but then realized that Raj wasn't waiting for an answer. He had assumed her answer was a yes and was already carrying her off to his kingdom. And just like him, not to even care about whom Mithkudi was taking water to. Mithkudi, for her part, should have brought a halt to the wedding festivities and all that followed and rescued her sister. But strangely, she didn't. Maybe she was busy with the incredibly misogynistic Raj having thrust books at her that claimed to be a crash course on domestic duties including cooking and cleaning. 
Even the fact that Mithkudi was a complete novice at domestic stuff and Barkudi actually enjoyed cooking, that should have served as a reminder to go help her sister who was stuck in a tree. Barkudi, meanwhile, still waited and waited for Mithkudi to return with water. She waited for days. Finally, Barkudi was plucking the courage to go look for water herself. But that's when she heard chatter and a large group of monkeys came upon the scene. Looking at the giant monkeys with sharp teeth, she decided it would be best for her to stay hidden in the hollow for now. All the monkeys, except a very old one, climbed the tree and began eating all the fruit. They went bananas over the persimmon, just as the princesses had done. The very old monkey could not climb. He begged the others to throw down some fruit, but they all refused. They thought he would be ungrateful and not do them any favours in return. This very old monkey remarked that it was exactly the opposite that he had in mind. He would share with them this meal he had found in the hollow of a nearby tree. But all the other monkeys thought he was deceiving them. He appealed to one of the monkeys, pointing out that they shared an Amazon account, and that made them prime mates, to which the monkey in question replied that it was this old monkey's poor dad jokes that got him such a cold shoulder in the first place. The old monkey retorted by saying that he had two cold shoulders waiting in the hollow and he'd get to eat this person all by himself. But still, no one paid him any attention. Barkudi did not gasp in reaction to having been discovered and having her shoulders named as the main course in tonight's dinner. Probably because she didn't understand the monkey language. After the rest of the monkeys departed, the old monkey suddenly pulled her out and devoured the princess. Just like that. That's not the end of the story, however. The old monkey walked over to the stream and drank his fill and then walked over to Raja's palace garden to do a bit of mischief there. But it must have been his age or maybe he ate too much that night. And princesses are such a rich food in monkey culture that his old body could not handle it anymore. When he reached the garden, he simply lay down and passed away. On the spot where his body was, a plant soon emerged, which soon grew quickly into a healthy little tree. It's unclear why the gardener didn't clear the monkey's body. Maybe there was a labour shortage or budget cuts in the garden too. By and by, the king's personal musician was strolling through the garden and saw this new little tree. He figured that this was the perfectly sized tree to make a musical instrument out of. So he chopped it down and fashioned himself a brand new banjo. He didn't need to fill out paperwork or wait for permission. The garden was neglected there were no officials or gardeners there to stop him chopping down the tree. When the banjo was completed, the musician thought it was beautiful, even if he said so himself. The one thing that was odd about it 
was that no matter what notes he played, the banjo always made the same tune. Which meant, it was a terrible banjo for writing new songs on. But on the flip side, this banjo was the perfect instrument to use during concerts. It would never get a single note wrong. He just had to lip sync to the words it was making. Now, as a purist musician myself, I should frown upon this new mechanism of deceiving the public. But it had a good outcome in the end. You see, the very first concert that the musician used the banjo on was attended by the queen herself, Mithkudi. I guess she had a break from her cooking and cleaning duties that night. Mithkudi was struck by the lyrics of the song, which went something like this. Who went looking for fruits? My sister and I. Who went looking for water? My sister, not I. Who became queen of the land? My sister, not I. And who got eaten by a monkey? I, not my sister. Mithkudi was sure Barkudi had somehow gotten recycled into that banjo. And so, she was determined to have it. She called the musician over for an intimate after-party for his amazing new composition. It would be just the two of them. The queen praised the banjo player heavily until he fell asleep from the drugged wine she had offered him. And then, when he was asleep, she quickly switched his banjo for a substitute that she had commissioned for the purpose. The musician woke up the next morning, dazed and confused and convinced he must have done something very wrong. He grabbed his banjo and ran out of the area. By the time he realized that the banjo he had picked up was not his magic banjo, he was too far away and too embarrassed to return and ask for it. Mithkudi, meanwhile, took excellent care of the banjo every day. She polished it and heard the song, even though it was a painful reminder of her own negligence. Mithkudi was certain that even the voice of the banjo had been turning more and more human every day. And now, it sounded identical to Barkudi's. At some point, the king began to notice that the taste of his wife's cooking had changed. And come to think of it, it might not even have been Mithkudi who was doing the cooking and cleaning. She seemed to have a lot more time to herself these days. And that did not sit well with Raj. One evening, when they were out walking, he casually asked her, who was doing all the cooking and cleaning now? Mithkudi was surprised by the question. Funny he should ask. When she thought he had hired a replacement, but Raj protested that he hadn't hired anyone. Why would he, he said, if Mithkudi had so much free time? But then, who's the girl who cleans up every day? asked the queen. She's been coming since the day I got the banjo. I mean, since the day our banjo player disappeared. Come to think of it, added Mithkudi. She hadn't actually seen the girl, but she had felt her presence. They both looked at each other and rushed home to investigate. As they sneaked a peek from behind their secret hiding spot behind the curtains, Mithkudi was thrilled to see that the girl cleaning everything 
was Barkudi. Yes, her sister had survived. Unlike their parents' kingdom, which lay in ruins in the absence of a successor. She read about the collapse of her dynasty in the newspaper. Barkudi was about to go and hide in her home, which seemed to be inside the banjo. But Raj jumped out of his hiding spot and told her she would be his queen. Just as he had done with Mithkudi when proposing to make her his queen. Now, I wish Barkudi had said no and rudely dealt with Raj for the way he was bossing over them. But she thought she was not in a position to choose. What with her own father's kingdom in ruins and her own living quarters were literally the size of a shoebox and all that. She could have refused and left the kingdom, but she wasn't ready for another adventure. In a tale full of miserable twists and turns, it would be at least a little redeeming to say that something good came out of it. So let's pretend that Mithkudi and Barkudi tag-teamed and jointly began running the kingdom and relegated Raj to the position of cook and cleaner. After all, it was his mismanagement that had left him, a king, without basic domestic stuff, and yet spending money on hunting trips and musicians. That's where we'll end it this week. A few notes. There are several variations of this story in the areas where Santali is spoken, including in Jharkhand, Odisha, and West Bengal. In some versions, it's not a group of monkeys, but a tiger who devours the younger sister. In others, it's actually cannibals, which is a bit more gruesome. The story makes no attempt to explain why Mithkudi did not just go back and get her sister. As is traditional on the show, the names of the characters are derived from the roles they play. Both names, Mithkudi and Barkudi, are amalgamations of Santali words. Myth and Bar are the numerals 1 and 2, respectively, and Kudi means girl. Raj refers to a king. In the next episode, we'll go sailing. Yes, we are going to dip into the ocean of the stream of stories, or the Kathasarit Sagar, as it is called. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories that you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com That's purple-planet.com I'll see you next time.